to this episode of Front Runner 2020. Before we start the program, let me say a few words about our purpose. We launched the Front Runner 2020 series to support and encourage you in your journey towards elected office. We present relevant programming for those aspiring to run so you can lay the groundwork and be prepared. In addition, some of our presentations are focused on strategies and tactics for use during your campaign. Our guests are the best in their field, and in some specialties, this means going outside of politics to the business community. You'll see that we emphasize marketing and building your brand as a core strategic component. There are many things you can do before you announce your candidacy that will enhance your potential and eliminate roadblocks that may get in your way. We recognize this path as a matter of personal growth and, yes, a calling. Please tell us what you need to be more successful, and we'll plan future programs around your feedback. Lillian Salerno works in our nation's capital. She's a recognized expert on the important crossover vote, and specifically the women's vote. She's led constituency outreach to women, veterans, and small businesses for political campaigns at the local, county, state, and national level. Lillian has helped elect numerous candidates and is currently assisting with the school board election in Fairfax County, the second largest school district in the country. She is a native of Dallas and came back to Texas in 2010 to work on the Bill White for governor race, concentrating on the women and crossover vote. During the 2008 presidential campaign, she played a key role in promoting unity and mobilizing women, especially the critical crossover vote for the Obama campaign. Ms. Salerno is a longtime advocate for increased accountability in politics. She has for many years advocated for transparency and good governance and believes that an increased number of women elected to political office will help eliminate the paralyzing gridlock in Washington. Lillian has lived and worked in rural communities, founded a small business, raised children, and passionately believes we must make huge changes in government at all levels in order to lead effectively and responsibly for today's working families and for future generations. She has served as spokeswoman on numerous panels, is a frequent conference speaker, and most recently appeared on television's the Executive Women's Roundtable in Washington. Lillian Salerno, entrepreneur, activist, and political commentator, poses the following question to potential women candidates. Why not run? Lillian? What I want to talk about tonight is um, you know, something that's just so keen and relevant for um, across the country is, you know, how do we break the deadlock in Washington? And what I know from my experience is we have to change some of the makeup of our elected officials. And one of those key elements is that we can do is elect more women. What we know is I think everyone on Main Street across the country understands that women represent somewhere over 50 percent of the population. And I'm not sure that anyone recognizes that 2011, we only represent 17% of the members of the U.S. Congress. 50% of the population and 17% of the U.S. Congress. And what we're going to talk about tonight is, you know, what do we, do, what do we need to do to make changes in this representation? And what that will look like? What kind of changes in our government, if we had, adequate representation of women, would this help stop some of the paralyzing gridlock that we have in Washington? And we're going to try to give uh, you know, some, some anecdotes and give information for those of you out there that are running, considering running for office. And it, it has to be a serious, thoughtful consideration, but it's doable. And so first, let's just look at the statistics, which are astounding. <laughs> women are 52% of the population. They only comprise the, uh, less than 17% of members of the U.S. Congress. Doesn't get any better when you get to the uh, at the state house. 88% of state governors are men. And then we get to the city. 93% of big city mayors are men. 
gets a little better when we get to at the state level, but not much. 75%, that means just at one quarter of statewide elected officials and state legislators are women. So we have a lot of work to do, and the time is now that we can make some, some substantial changes in the makeup of our uh, legislative body. And that's what, what, that's what we're here to talk about, is what would that look like? You know, can we do it? Yes. And can you imagine if we did what, what the country would look like? Well, I sort of can because I, we know I've been living in the Washington, D.C. area and watching when we do get serious thought and deliberation in Congress, real, real helpful things happen. Can you imagine if we had a half or even a third of the members of Congress today? Would we be facing our country's first ever financial default? Would the debt ceiling debate would have, re would have gone on as long as it has with just rhetoric and uncompromising positions? The answer is no. I've never seen a group of women stand around and do nothing when there's a crisis at hand. And the U.S. is in a crisis position today on many issues. If we had the kind of representation needed at, at the national level, there would be no question that there would not be this deadlock, the pontificating for weeks about what to do. Women get up and they roll up their sleeves to get something done. They tend to their flock. And women step up to the plate uh, on every occasion and if we can get women to recognize that they can hold these offices, that they are qualified, their presence will translate into better policy for American families. There's a book out called uh, The Wisdom of Crowds, uh, I think it came out around 2008, that talks about when you have a diverse group in age and gender and race, look at a decision. The decision is, the research shows it's always better when it's when it's discussed and deliberated by varying people. And if we can get this, the diversity in our legislative bodies will make serious changes. Thanks, Lillian. Well, let's ask our audience here to, to join you in that uh, visioning exercise. What changes do you predict with proportionate representation of women in Congress? Let's say it's more like 50% instead of the current 17%. You can select more than one in your control panel now. Bipartisan collaboration, greater transparency, increased spending on social programs, family-friendly policy, protect Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bipartisan collaboration is 25%, greater transparency 50%, increased spending on social programs 50%, family friendly policy 100%, protect Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid 50%. What do you think, Lillian? Well, I'm so happy that people recognize when, you, when one uh, says family friendly policy that that means, you know, pretty much everything, uh, because family-friendly policy means we take care of both all generations, all, all, uh, all sectors of society, and that translates into better quality of life, more jobs. That's family-friendly friendly policy for jobs. And I think one of the things when the bipartisan collaboration, I guess 25%, um, I have an antidote on that, and uh, what it is is in 2008, in D.C., we were working on an issue uh, regarding health there. This was before the president was elected. It was at the beginning of 2008, and we're just trying to get a very significant committee to hold a hearing on a very important issue of controlling health care costs. It was better for families. There were a coalition of uh, very strange bedfellows like you know union and consumers union as well as small business as well as uh, healthcare workers and we worked you know many months to try to get them to hold the hearing and the hearing that the uh, committee held instead of our hearing what bumped us off was whether or not Roger Clemens had taken uh, steroids I'm not saying that's not an important issue but it was a $40 billion issue that we were ringing to them to save health care costs. And instead of holding our hearing, 
which was a bunch of people work doing very good things on, on a very important issue like health care. Instead of that, you know, the powers that be, which are, again, 83% men, decided because of, you know, whatever, they decided that the Roger Clemens hearing would be uh, trumped our $40 billion cost uh, um, reduction in cost in health care. So that's, that's just an, um, one antidote. Um, so women, what can women do and why, why do we want them in there? Well, they can forge common, solution, common sense solutions, help break the gridlock. Uh, you know, they, they understand that there's collaboration and cooperation when you attack an issue. This idea of the power of no without any way to compromise, it's just not in many women's makeup uh, to not do anything week after week. And uh, research shows that once we get about a third of the elected officials being women, the public policy debate would shift dramatically. And part of that reason is the discourse would be more family friendly because of some of the things that are on the minds of some of our male legislators, and, and there's good male legislators obviously, some of the things that are on their mind come because they come out of big corporate interests. And very many times in, in Washington, you see people come with, you know, their money comes from big corporate interests, and so they're, they're hard-pressed to make decisions that are against those corporate interests. Since women represent, are represented by so, you know, sort of miserably in the corporate world as well, where less than 3% of CEOs are women, they're, they're not as beholden to corporate interests, and I am sorry of my, if this sounds cynical, but I'm, I'm just showing, I'm, I'm just discussing the reality that I know after working in Washington for many years that, you know, it's about campaign finance and, you know, corporate interests sometimes govern, and with women in, in roles of leadership in Congress, I, I think we could have more discussion and deliberation that keeps that piece out. Now, this is my favorite part of uh, this, you know, sort of outline that I did, um, how we do it versus how they do it. And this is a, these are real antidotes of people that I've worked with. And um, this is just the, the thought process and what I've seen from candidates. And this is a story of Jack and Jill. Now, Jill, um, I've worked with on several campaigns. She has a law degree. She was a teacher. She ran the PTA. She founded a teen center in, in one of the towns that I've lived in in my life. She served on the school district task for, uh, force. She, during the Obama presidential, registered the most voters for the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. She is a, today a current candidate for Fairfax County School Board. At the time when we were examining for her to run, after all a full life raising children along with all of these uh, you know, accomplishments, she wasn't confident that she could run for school board, that she knew enough to run for school board. Another person, I'll call him Jack, he was a great organizer for the Obama campaign. He had a political science degree that he had just gotten, 23 years old. An opportunity came up in Maryland to have a, a state delegate, uh, with a, a delegate race uh, for the state legislator in uh, Maryland, and it came an opportunity. There was no question he put his name on the ballot and ran and only lost by 300 votes. He works at the White House now. He's a, just a generous, wonderful young man. And the difference, and I called him and asked that I could use his example, but this idea of, you know, he felt passion about his issue. He's a great, he wants to be a great public servant, and he ran. But this idea of whether to run didn't, didn't come up to him. I mean, he was able to raise money. He had been a great organizer, but he was 23 years old. Whereas, you know, Jill went through, you know, a, a whole year of looking at whether or not she was qualified to run. And, and I think these capture sort of what the difference between when men and women decide to run from my experience.